All right. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to today's, today's jam. Welcome to <laughs> today's jam session. Uh, we'll go ahead and just give everyone a minute or so to join, and then we'll kick us off and get us started. How are you doing today, Paul? I'm doing good. <laughs> We're dealing with like 10 inches of snow in Cleveland. So I'm, uh, yeah, we dug out and I was able to get to the office today. So I'm happy. <laughs> My kids are back in school, so we're all good. It is a blessing to have the kids back <laughs> in school. <laughs> yeah, so it, we had a cold front here in South Florida this week. It was 55 degrees out. So mm, you don't feel bad. I'd be golfing in that. If I just... <laughs> Plenty of people are. <laughs> uh, I walked outside in a normal T-shirt earlier this week, and I was like, ooh. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. So I don't feel your pain on, no. on the snow. Um, but my kids were happy. I mean, they got a snow day and they got to go play in the snow. So it was good. I don't mind the snow. As long as like the streets get cleared and it's not crazy. And I, I like it when it snows once and then the snow just stays there through mm -hmm. December. And then after December, I'm I'm done with snow. Like once yeah. we get to the holidays, I I'm I've seen enough of the snow and I'm ready for the grass again. <laughs> I don't I I've never lived anywhere where it snowed. I I've spent chunks of time in in yeah. you know, vac like longer extended vacations in cold climate, but I've never had to deal with scraping a windshield or or getting special coats for different levels of winter. So it sounds romantic. <laughs> <laughs> You're not missing much. <laughs> you know, but um, you know. What are you going to do? <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll get started. Um, you guys have already heard Paul and I kick it off. So uh, <laughs> welcome to today's jam session, Paul. It's really exciting to have you here. Um, so before we get started, uh, let's talk a little bit about what our jam sessions are, right? If uh, this is your first time attending a rock content jam session, um, they are something that we kicked off a couple of months ago and we, we use them almost as a container of, of our webinars, right? They're a mix of presentations. I host a series of, uh, jam sessions that are, that are targeted to in marketers that are interested in interactive content. And so we focus on best practices in those sessions. And then we also have sessions like this one where we invite industry thought leaders and experts on specific topics in marketing and content, uh, such as Paul, like Paul. Um, and we do an interview style uh, session, you know, talk about their careers, talk about things that they've learned along, you know, their journey to where they are today, and hopefully walk away giving uh, our attendees some inspiration and ideas on how they can do something similar in their own marketing initiatives. Um, some of our experts in the past have included uh, Robert Rose, Joe Plissy attended a couple of weeks ago, we had Rand Fishkin. Um, so some really well-known uh, marketers have joined us for these sessions and we're really excited to continue offering these to our audience. Um, so my name is Stephanie, kind of already said that, but my name is Stephanie and I'm the head of content here at Rock Content. So I oversee all of our content production. Um, and I am really excited that Paul is joining us today. Paul uh, is um, an expert in AI and he joins us from uh, he's a CEO of PR 2020 and Marketing Artificial Intelligent Institute, and also the author of several books. And I'll give Paul a chance to introduce himself <laughs> uh, to you guys in just a second. But as a marketer and as a marketer content strategist at a content company, I absolutely see a lot of opportunities for AI to not only um, help us with the content that we create, but even help us improve our strategies and, you know, create better experiences for our customers and for the readers of our content. Um, and it's, it's actually, as, even though AI is 100% part of my everyday life, I mean, a minute ago, I was yelling at Alexa to remind me to wait to notify me in 10 minutes that I had to be back at my desk. Um, but, you know, Netflix were you know, making recommendations to me on what I should watch. I 100% love that. And Spotify's Discover Weekly playlist is nine out of 10 times really accurate on music that I like. And so I truly enjoy the benefits and personalization that AI provides to me in my personal life. And so I can see that it would also help me improve my marketing. So I'm really excited to have Paul here to hopefully educate me as well as you guys on things that I can do and use AI to improve. So um, 
thank you, Paul, for joining us and for sharing your knowledge. Yeah, no, I'm happy to do it. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. As you can see, it's going to be all over the place because that's just how, <laughs> <All right. laughs> how I roll. Um, all right, cool. So um, I kind of to told a little bit about you. I didn't list all your books. I thought that could be something that uh, that you could share with us since there's a lot of really uh, interesting topics that you've uh, written about. So um, for for anyone that may not be familiar, uh, why don't you why don't you share a little bit about your your body of work? Yeah. So I, um, again, Paul Ratzer, thanks for having me. Um, I started my agency in 2005. It was actually um, November of 05. So we just had our 15 year anniversary, which is kind of crazy. Congrats. Thank you. It feels like a, a lifetime. <laughs> but then again, for many of us, the last seven months feels like a lifetime. So um, the agency has been great. And we were HubSpot's first partner. So some people may recognize PR 2020 um, from the HubSpot ecosystem. We have any HubSpot partners out there. So we started working with HubSpot in 2007 and we're kind of the origin of today, what has become a pretty massive ecosystem of um, service firms and tech partners. And so, yeah, uh, that led to my first book, The Marketing Agency Blueprint, which was taking a lot of our learnings and our ideas about where the marketing industry was going with what HubSpot was doing and automation at the time. And the premise was how to build a modern marketing agency, like 10 rules for building a modern marketing agency. So I wrote that in 2011. Shortly after that is when I started down the AI discovery path, trying to figure out what it was and how it would eventually play into marketing and sales. And then I took a break in 2014 and wrote the second book, The Marketing Performance Blueprint. That was the first time I publicly talked about AI. So there's actually a bit of an Easter egg in that book. So somewhere within the 50,000 word manuscript is about 500 to 1,000 words about AI and the future of marketing. And um, when I finished that book, that really became my passion and where I spent the vast majority of my time doing research and writing and eventually started speaking about AI and eventually split off a second business to focus on uh, making AI approachable and actionable for other marketers. And that's kind of how we got to today. And I still run both businesses, but um, focusing a lot of my energy on education and events for AI to help marketers figure out, figure out the space. Yeah, I love that. So what 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 happened in in that time frame around 2014 that made you realize that there was a, a need um, for someone to invest in in creating this knowledge base for for AI and marketing? Yeah, for me, it just started out as a curiosity. So I wrote the manuscript for the first book uh, over a three month period from April to June of 2011. Um, that year in, I think, January, or early February was when IBM Watson won on Jeopardy, beat uh, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter on Jeopardy. And I remember at the time thinking that's kind of fascinating. What is that technology? How does that work? How is a machine coming up with answers for questions that doesn't seem like it should know? And so once I finished the manuscript for my book, I started trying to figure out what is Watson and could it ever be applied to marketing? And I had a very specific use case in mind. So when I graduated college in 2000 and I came out of a journalism school with a marketing and business background, um, there was like five to seven ways to spend marketing budget. I mean, we, the iPhone was seven years from being created. Mm -hmm. Social media wasn't a thing. Blogging was n just Most starting in the industry. Yeah, yeah. So you had, you had trade shows, you had direct mail, you had telemarketing, you had advertising, you had PR, like there's these fundamental things that if you went through college in the eighties, nineties or before, like you, you learned the same things. Mm -hmm. And so fast forward to 2012 and into 2013, I'd come to believe the human mind was no longer capable of building an optimal marketing strategy. That if someone came to me and said, I need 500 leads in Q1 of next year, how do we get them? I had come to believe that, well, why, why am I pretending as a human with my limited knowledge and experience to be able to figure out how to do that be best? And so my theory was, well, what if you had a Watson-like machine that knew everything we'd ever done and potentially anonymized data from thousands of other businesses? Couldn't it take all that information in and run a predictive model of the best way for me to get 500 leads? And then as the human, I would say, yeah, that, that makes sense, what the machine's recommending, I'll do that. And so I looked around and I saw this was happening in healthcare, in logistics, in e-commerce to a degree already. 
Um, but Wall Street in particular, 70% of all trades on Wall Street in 2012 were being made by machines with no human interaction. And so I was looking at saying, well, that's far more complex than how to spend a marketing budget. And that led me down this path of like, well, can it do that? Like, what does AI actually do? And could it, could it do this eventually? And so I went down this path for years of potentially going the path of building this theoretical intelligence engine. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. But that that led to where we are today. <laughs> No, I love that. Um, yeah, so I was talking to a, a, a kid, a, I, I don't want to say kid, but a kid on my team, you know, he's, <laughs> he's, you know in his early 20s. Yeah. And um, we were talking about uh, when I first got started in marketing it was the early 2000s. And I had said to him, I had said something to him about leads, you know, about how originally, actually, I think I was originally quoting Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross to him. Mm -hmm. And I said something about leads. And he was like, wait, Leads were around then, and I'm like, leads were what? What? <laughs> and, <think> marketers did. <laughs> and, and I said, yes, but in you know 2001, in my first job, when I had to get leads for the marketing team, it was a completely different story of how yeah. I how we acquired leads, and then also not only how I acquired the leads for the mar for the sales team, but also how I distributed them to the sales team. Uh, back then, it was a uh, uh, the leads would come in and we would print them and I would put them on the, the sales reps desks. Um, but it was just so funny to me that he was like, wait a second, <laughs> leads have been around for that That's long. Hilarious. I know. And, and it's just but but even thinking about my first role in marketing, um, you know, when I knew I had to help acquire get get leads acquired for the sales team, we were doing, um, you know, we, we had uh, people that would call, you know, and, and try to sell things over the phone. And then they would take the information down and then we would print those leads and then walk them to the sales reps based on the skills of that sales rep. So even just AI now solves that problem, right? Mm -hmm. Of like actually distributing the leads to people based on, you know, well, HubSpot does this, you yeah. know how this is. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I just, no, but it, and it's like for, con <laughs> for context, again, if, it's, if there's younger, you know, listeners or viewers, 2014, when my second book came out, that was like the, the I don't know if this is truly accurate, but like the peak of the marketing automation boom. So HubSpot IPO'd in 2014, September of 14. Um, uh, Salesforce bought Exact Target for two and a half billion dollars. Exact Target had bought Pardot for $870 million. Marketo wasn't far from IPOing. Like all of these human powered automation tools. There were, there was no AI in it. The, the, the mm -hmm. machine wasn't getting smarter. The software didn't get better on its own. It didn't make you a better marketer. It was as good as you as a marketer were able to tell it what to do. And we're talking about billions of dollars pouring into the industry for what was human powered automation. So that's just six years ago. Like yeah. we're still so early in the adoption of AI in marketing to where the tools actually can get smarter and make you a better marketer out of the box. Um, this is, it's a relative, AI is literally goes back to the 1950s. Like the concept of AI isn't new. The application to marketing and sales is very new and it, products are still very immature for the most part. Yeah, but I, I absolutely cannot even imagine, uh, I mean, you know, thinking back on when you opened your agency 15 years ago, right? So like what has happened in those 15 years, 15 years ago, I was still working in a very, you know, junior marketing role, but like everything was like super manual and, and, and I was making guesses all the time about the things I needed to try. We were just getting started with trying to understand uh, paid search and our ads were very invasive at the time. It was yeah. all kinds of pop ups and, and you know, it was not a very uh, respectable industry that I was doing marketing and it was debt consolidation at the time, which obviously yeah, yeah. in the mid 2000s was like all the rage. Um, but it was my first real marketing role. Yeah. Um, but just thinking about like the mistakes that I made back then that could have been avoided had we had the tools. I mean, that 23 year old, I, I hope he's listening to this and it's probably like, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> but um, just how fortunate and how much, um, how much more data we have available to us to help us make better decisions. And, and also just to your point, um, it, I've been here at this, at the well with working on the ion product since early 2015 mm -hmm. and how much has changed in that time, you know, early on when we uh, relaunched the, inter uh, the ion platform to be more about uh, interactive content, it was originally mm -hmm. a landing page platform. It was really important that we also talked about all the integrations that you can have so that all of the engagements that a user has with an interactive 
piece of content can be captured and surfaced to your marketing automation platform and just how that has changed and evolved over the years. And you know, we have these native integrations with Marketo and HubSpot and Eloqua mm-hmm. and all of these really great tools that help us be better marketers, um, but just the advancements in the platforms that we integrate with just in this short amount of time. Um, it is uh, an evolving uh, industry and an evolving um, practice. So no, no doubt. very interesting. So, um, okay. So that's <laughs> that's a really, uh, really great backstory. So you mentioned a couple of times um, that, you know, the idea of a marketing automation tool. So mm. are you in the process of developing one or, you know, exploring the options or did you already develop one? You know, no. what, what... so, <laughs> so <laughs> what, what I, what I was envisioning hasn't been built yet. Um, I'm still a huge believer that it will be. It, it, the simplest way to understand it is like AI, the, the core form of AI is called machine learning and machine learning does, it's a subset of AI. So AI is just this umbrella term of tools and technologies that make machines smart. So machines don't know it how to do anything out of the box. They have to be told by humans what to do. They can't see, they can't hear, they can't understand, they can't generate language. Like none of that is native to software or computers, machines. So what AI does is it gives machines, gives software the ability to do these human-like things. And at its core is machine learning. And what machine learning is, is it's very literal. It is a machine that learns. So Mm -hmm. it takes data in and it improves its ability to predict outcomes and behavior based on new data. So you started off with Netflix and Spotify. What the machine is doing in that case, meaning this group of algorithms, it's learning your viewing behavior. And it's predicting that if you watched this, this, and this, you would like this show. Or that if you listen to these 10 songs, you're gonna like these other 10 songs. And so what you realize is everything we do as marketers, we're generally, making predictions. We don't think about it that way. But when you create a piece of content, you're trying to predict what topic will resonate with your audience. And then once you create it, you're trying to predict what topics should I cover? What questions do people have? And a lot of this is instinct. And a lot of it, you may do keyword research and you may find like different ways to do it. But once you create it, then how do you surface to them? How do you know who that comes to your site is likely to want to see that piece of content. So you think about that Netflix example again. Mm -hmm. So right now as a marketer, you're writing a rule for every one of these things. So once you create the piece of content, I'm now going to tell my automation tool to surface this when someone lands on this page, show them this pop up to trigger this thing. And then if they do that, trigger these three emails. And in those emails, I'm picking subject lines that I think they're going to open and then a CTA that I think they'll click on you're actually making these little predictions in every single thing you do. And that's where AI enables us to go as marketers. And so the big picture to me is like this recommendation engine for everything, for strategy. And we're, we're really far from that as an industry. So that's what I realized years ago was um, the people who should build that are the big platform companies. Someone, mm-hmm. someone should. And I would guess that there are a number of them that are working on that, but they're not very close as, from what I've seen. They're working on individualized like content recommendation engines versus yeah. entire strategy recommendations. Yeah, and as a marketer and as someone who's in content, I can absolutely appreciate when I land on a website that I've engaged with before, engaged with content in or have had a conversation with someone uh, at that organization about something, if I go to the website and I can tell that there is content that's being dynamically populated based on my role, my industry, um, a, a good company that a company that does this really well is um, Demandbase. Mm-hmm. Demandbase's platform can dynamically populate content based on things I did after I left their site. And so if I'm in a marketing role, a marketing industry, they're going to show me case studies that are from other marketers and for people that are or from uh, businesses that are in the same industry as me, because that means that I'm going to probably convert faster and be more interested in seeing the value of their solution um, because they're showing me content that's relevant to me. And I can 100% appreciate that. Um, and I think it, it's very smart and, and I, I love what you said about, um, also having a platform that can help me make, uh, subject line recommendations based on what that individual user might actually click on because 
you know, that's something that is we can make lists of, you know, in our, our email platform and, and, you know, tailor the headlines or the subject lines to those lists, but getting as granular as like users or like previously opened emails, like, ah, oh, that would be just delightful. <laughs> yeah. Stuff that either we previously haven't had the ability to do because there's so much data, you just don't do it and you continue mm -hmm. to rely on instinct and some educated guesses and maybe a little bit of data to, to drive what you do as a content marketer. Uh, but I'm of the belief that in the not too distant future, all of that will be machine assisted, what to write, when to write it, what questions yeah. to answer. Uh, and to machines can, to a degree, actually create a, a good portion of it for you um, with technology that exists today. So, yeah, it's one tool that I have not seen come out. And that's that is a really good or really well built content strategy platform that helps us um, do more than than just uh, create content. I don't know. I don't know exactly where I'm going with that. But I no. think you understand, you know, like, we just don't have any platforms out there that are um, help us have predictability with our with our content strategy. They, they exist, like we're trying to, we're working on the 2021 editorial calendar for the marketing Institute now. And so I mean, we're, we're practitioners, like I'm not just up preaching about this and running events and doing online mm -hmm. education for AI, like we, we live it, we, we mm -hmm. we're building a, a media company that we have to create content that draws in an audience. Um, using interactive tools like Ion, like there's lots of ways we do it, but we're in that same boat. It's like, well, what do we write about? Which audience do we want to target? What content do we have on our site that could perform better if we enriched it? And so we use a tool called Market Muse to do that. It actually analyzes everything on the site and then it predicts which pieces of content have greater potential to draw in more traffic and it recommends to you which ones to republish. And then once you go into work on that existing piece of content, it actually guides you as to what to enrich it with, what other information to weave into that piece of content so that when you republish it, it has the chance to perform at a higher level. So there are, there are definitely tools to do pieces of these things, but there's no like, build an editorial calendar for me, computer, yeah. like that doesn't <laughs> exist. <laughs> I'm not trying to be lazy. <laughs> I would love it. I'm not saying we shouldn't build it, but it doesn't exist right now. Yeah. I just want to focus my energy on things that excite me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love a market muse. I love uh, actually um, Click Z, which is uh, the the Anne Hanley's original. Yeah, that is. Uh, I would like to say that that's where I learned marketing was Click Z. Mm -hmm. You know, I I feel like um, when that. I cannot remember. I know that it was very early that she sold Clixy and it was it's been around since like what the 90s, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, really amazing resource that practically taught me everything that I know. So yeah. Um okay, so you had mentioned um earlier that you were the HubSpot's first partner. Mm -hmm. Um so can you tell us a little bit more about that relationship between your agency and 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 HubSpot? And you know, do you guys do are you guys working on projects together? Um, you know, what what does that relationship look like? Yeah. So the the origin again goes back to 2007, and uh, I signed on as an early HubSpot customer for the agency, and it was honestly at the time uh, it was $250 a month was the license, and um, they were providing all kinds of training and, and um, onboarding materials that I could use for my team. And again, that period of time, the iPhone had just been invented, had come to market. Social media was just emerging. Um, Twitter, I think, was created in 2007, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Facebook yeah. became publicly available to the average consumer in 2006. So like literally the marketing world had just transformed overnight. And HubSpot seemed to offer this promise of preparing and educating the next generation of marketers. So that's why I signed on. And we didn't even use the JavaScript on our site for like three months after that. But because I'd built PR 2020 to change the agency model, so I wanted to do away with billable hours. Mm -hmm. And we moved to a concept of standardized services set pricing. So we had this very defined list of services and there was published pricing guide for it. So it was total transparency. And so once we realized what HubSpot was actually capable of, I quickly built a suite of services wrapped around HubSpot software. So if you bought HubSpot and you didn't want to do the work yourselves or you didn't have the team to do it, 
you could actually buy one of our service packages and we would do landing pages and keyword analysis and we would run email campaigns and we would like basically do HubSpot for you. Yeah. Um, and we were the only ones doing it. And so HubSpot started sending everybody to us. And so in 2008, the agency grew 100%. Um, I then went to the first inbound marketing summit in, in uh, fall of 08, spoke at that. There was like 300 of us in the yeah. Cambridge Marriott. Now there's 30,000 at the convention center. Yeah. Um, went to dinner that night with a bunch of the speakers, including Brian Halligan and Dharma Shah, the co-founders, and David Merman Scott, and Chris, Bog and Chris Brogan, and Christopher Penn, and like just this crazy group of all these people who were kind of in this new marketing realm. I got to know Brian and Darmesh really well. Um, on the flight home, wrote a blog post called Dawn of the Inbound Marketing Agency that became like this theory of where the agency world was going to go. And it just kind of took off from there. And um, Halligan eventually, I think in 2010, green-lighted building the partner program formally and funded you know, staffing and building out their ecosystem of agency partners. And today we're still uh, you know, one of the top partners in the HubSpot ecosystem. So we are you know, a HubSpot agency, a HubSpot customer, and then HubSpot is a corporate sponsor of the Marketing AI Institute. So we work closely with them and have some inside uh, insights into their AI roadmap. And we just did a webinar last month with Kevin Walsh, the project management lead for AI projects at HubSpot. So yeah, it's just, I mean, they're just an incredible company. It's been a great relationship through the years. It's still the core, the engine of everything we do and the vast majority of our clients at the agency or HubSpot customers. Oh, I love that. Yeah, uh, one of our uh, IONS co-founders is Scott Brinker. Who, yeah, Scott's a good, yeah. a good friend. Yeah, yeah, Scott's a great guy. Love a Scott. Yeah. And uh, Scott, um, you know, obviously being one of the original founders of ION, have a, a pretty good relationship with him. Our relationship is mostly based on gifts at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, occasionally, I'll just send him a gif on on LinkedIn to say what's up and get my gift back and we go about our day. <laughs> Scott was one of the first talks I did on AI was actually at, uh, I think, Scott's first MarTech conference. It was oh, either yeah. the first or the second, but right mm -hmm. after the book came out, I, I went and did a talk where I, um, it was the first time I spoke about that intelligence engine concept was actually um, doing one of the keynotes at his conference. So yeah, I, Scott's just a great guy. Such a great guy, and I, yeah. I, um, I, I love how. So um, over the years, there's been many conversations that I've joined either with like a, a customer of Ions or maybe just another marketer that's just wants some interactive content advice or just something. Mm -hmm. And they're like, "Well, let me show you this," and then they pull up the super graphic, and I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm well aware. <laughs> I've watched it evolve over the years." When it was 120 in the first year, and then 300, yeah. <laughs> Where you could actually see all the logos and make yeah, out. There was this like content. unspoken rule as a marketing speaker: you you had to use that image somewhere in your deck of like every talk you gave. Over Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Last year, uh, or well, now 2020, this year when he released it. It, it was so large that it was the first year that they involved um what is it air table yeah. where you actually like had to be able to you you there was no way you were going to find you could be we for a while we were looking at it and some of us here were like where are we <laughs> like we just could not find ourselves and i started to draft a snarky message to scott like um <laughs> but, my my guess is through the years if Scott had a dollar for every time someone emailed said, like, oh, can you I'm turn sure. this into a database? <laughs> He's like, you know what? He'd, he'd be retired. <laughs> yeah, he would be for sure. Um, so talking a little bit more about um the partnerships that you've made with SaaS uh, mm -hmm. companies over there, you are now also partnering up with uh, Drift, right? So um, can you tell us how you know HubSpot and Drift are um, embedding AI technology into their products and you know, like a practical example um, you know, that, that you've seen uh, of them trying to use it and maybe even in other startups too? Yeah, so I mean, HubSpot in particular is very focused on extremely practical use cases. So they they kind of categorically look at the the main area that they've been focused on is the data cleanliness. So um, automatic recognition of duplicate context in your CRM, for example. Mm -hmm. So it, the machine learning algorithm is looking for uh, contacts that it thinks is the same person that you're treating as two different people. So you have two different CRM records. Everything that's happening is existing in these silos. The machine looks and recognizes says, we think this is the same person different name, maybe different email address, is mm -hmm. it? And so the human still says, well, yeah, and if, as a matter of fact, that is definitely the same person. Go ahead, machine, merge that contact. So that's a really practical example. Another would be like 
you know, if you're at do a lot of trade shows, a business card scanner. So they use the same kind of computer vision technology that you do to ch scan checks. It's like if you go to your bank and it feeds in, that technology was created in the 1990s to do uh, character recognition of handwritten notes as well as numbers on checks so that it could automatically recognize what the check said and deposit it. Well, they do that for business cards. So you take a picture in the app, it recognizes everything on the card, and then it automatically uploads that into a CRM record or recognizes an existing record and adds, enriches the data. So they've done a lot of things like that. They're doing things with like sales emails where they'll actually, the machine's reading the email. It's using what's called natural language processing to read mm -hmm. the email and then recommend some basic things like it's too long or you should use these words. Um, if you use Grammarly, you're familiar, familiar with that kind of technology. Grammarly is a free app for many. There's paid versions, but it's looking at what you're writing, understanding what you're saying, and and recommending ways to say it better. That's all all AI. That's not possible without AI. Yeah. Um, so HubSpot has about a dozen features today that it touts. If you go to HubSpot slash I think it's artificial intelligence is actually the URL or just search it in Google, you'll see the 10 or so areas that they've built specific AI tools. Um, for Drift, it's largely been about conversational AI because that's their business, conversational marketing and sales for the most part. And so what they're doing is if you think about a chat bot, everyone assumes that a chat bot equals AI, it does not. The vast majority of chat bots you interact with on any website is highly likely predominantly human powered, meaning someone writes a bunch of rules. If they ask this, give them that. If they do this, should do this. AI enables the, the chat bot to actually understand what's being asked and surface content or answers in the context of that question and potentially in the context of the individual asking it. So the AI can know everything you've ever done. Are you a customer? Are you not a customer? Did you just call the 800 line and complain about something and now you're on the site complaining about it? Like, the AI can know all of that instantaneously. And so Drift has made a lot of investments in technology to better understand intent and to better understand language so that the, the chat bot can truly become a support agent, that it can actually be there and be helpful in real time as someone's asking uh, for information or looking for help. Yeah, I love that. And so, I mean, before we we started, we were talking a little bit about um, you know your experience building in our platform and and using our support. And so we have chat support, you know, obviously, which which is really helpful because our platform does a lot of really amazing things. But there's you know a time when someone has to ramp up and learn how to use it. And because we have in platform chat, you know, we have a pretty active group of individuals that help our customers build better interactive experiences. Um, but every customer is different in terms of how much time they've invested in learning the platform, how much time they've invested in going through our training, um, what their role is, because mm -hmm. how a designer builds in our platform versus how a marketer builds in our platform is going to be wildly different. And um, while our chat is very much, you know, managed by, by, by people, it would be really interesting to, if we had, you know, this AI functionality where we could almost like, um, segment, uh, uh, you know, like if a marketer comes on and a marketer starts to struggle with, you know, data collection, because that's what's important to the marketer and they go to open up our chat box, wouldn't it be really great if we could put them with a marketing support person versus putting them with someone that putting a designer with a designer? Um, I'll, I'll give you a free uh, piece of advice. So there's a tool called phrase.io, F-R-A-S-E.io. If you go to the Marketing Institute site, it's the knowledge assistant on our site. Mm -hmm. what it does is it automatically trains itself on the site content. So if you're a content marketer and you've created all this incredible stuff, blog posts and webinars and eBooks and landing pages and pillar pages and all this stuff sitting there, most likely you have a search function on the site that delivers a bunch of URLs. Like yeah. just, there's a, what the knowledge assistant does is it, it learns, it processes all the stuff on your site and within hours learns everything on the site. And then when it's asked a question, it actually tries to find the single best answer. So if you think about how like a voice assistant works, yeah. it tries to search. And then what it does, and this is where machine learning, a very practical way for people to understand machine learning, it'll surface what it thinks is the, the answer to your question, but then it asks you, did this answer your question? Like a yes, mm -hmm. no, or a thumbs up, thumbs down. Every time you hit that, you're teaching the machine just like you would in Spotify. Show me another song like that. Show me, don't show me a song like that. That's what it does. So it uses machine learning to learn 
it just gave the consumer a good answer to a question. And so you can actually reduce the need of the staff to have to send me, the user of Ion, <laughs> the same how-tos that are yeah. all live. Because you got, I mean, again, I'm an Ion user. You have an incredible lot knowledge library of answers to every question of how to do every single thing I'm going to need to do. But instead of Dave always <laughs> having to be like my guy, <laughs> there's no reason that a knowledge assistant couldn't do it. And Dave couldn't be monitoring, be the human in the loop, monitoring the knowledge assistant and teaching the knowledge assistant along. That was a good answer. So yeah, it's, a, it's a human and machine. Like the AI isn't going to replace all of us. It's not taking content marketer jobs. It's not taking customer service jobs. It's going to enhance what we're capable of so that you can actually focus more energy on the true human interactions, creativity, mm -hmm. strategy, things like that. Yeah, no, I love that. And I hope that there is some rocker that's watching this that take, took, took note of that, or I'll just go to the site and find it later because that's mm -hmm. really interesting because you, you're you right. So the ION platform has been around since 2007. It has evolved quite a bit over the last 13 years, but during that time we have created and updated and improved so much support material and you know not every single question is going to be answered in our knowledge base but a good majority can be and it's not right. even just a you know a customer thing you know it's um even an in internal you know we have right. our internal slack channels where we have you know people are asking questions all the time about you know can ion integrate with this can ion do this and 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 my immediate response most of the time is to not say yes or no it's to just right. post the link to the support post like hey <laughs> right. do your homework but it would be really great if we if that that just sounds like a really helpful feature and honestly something that our customers would appreciate too right like yeah, they, we don't want them the to go to the work I mean, ai is all about like it's not this overwhelming abstract thing it's finding practical use cases so that mm -hmm. is a perfect example because it's not saying the system doesn't work. Like what you're saying is it does work. Someone posts it, you Slack link, but that just took 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. And if the person who knows that that link exists is off that day, now it might be another three minutes and do that 20 times a day. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, there's all this time being spent on something that there is absolutely AI tech and phrases isn't the only one doing this mm -hmm. to have a knowledge assistant that learns it, that doesn't ever forget it and doesn't you know, doesn't take days off, like yeah. it's just there. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it, that's a really good use case for people to think about. Like there's just these very practical ways to do your job smarter with AI. Yeah, someone probably has pinged Dave and told him that we just mentioned him. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Dave, like, he's great. <laughs> what are they talking about? And can we get that tool? <laughs> because I'm all about making my job better and smarter. Yeah. Um, so, um, how about, so we're talking a little bit about bots, right? Mm -hmm. So would you say that all bots are powered by AI technology? And if not, uh, what is there, a, what is what is the difference? And um, is there a way to recognize that? Um, recognizing might be hard for the, the average user. Um, uh, no, they're not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the vast majority aren't. And again, it goes back to the rules-based logic. So it's just like with marketing automation. If you're creating a three-part email workflow to nurture someone who downloads an email, you're doing all of it. You're figuring out what to send, how to trigger it, which days does it go, when does it stop? Um, all of those things you as a marketer have to figure out. And in a lot of cases with chatbots, there's this extensive onboarding process to where the person or people within the organization who have the knowledge of what the experience should be, have to write all of those rules. You have to think about all the questions that might come in. You have to layer it over all the resources you have to answer those questions. You have to do your FAQs. Um, and so in a lot of instances with chatbots, they're basically just trying to avoid getting to a human so they don't have to have the, the, the cost of having a human deal with something, but it's normally just human powered rules to avoid that. Yeah. Um, what, what we're talking about with like a phrase is is it trains itself. You give it a data set, a, 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 set, a corpus of knowledge, it learns from it, and then it tries to predict the right answer. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I wanna talk about something you said in a previous interview. Okay. Okay, so um, I, I did my homework and I listened to some <laughs> of your previous interviews. Um, 
Uh, if I had an AI to do this for me, that would have been fantastic. But, but it was interestingly good. enough, it might be something in the works. <laughs> yeah, all the time, right? Yep. Um, so, <laughs> um, but in a previous interview, you said that um, AI helps revenue acceleration and cost reduction, yep. um, which is something I think we've touched on a little bit already in this conversation. Um, in in terms of time, especially right, like we time is money and. Um, Anytime we can cut down on our time, we can focus our efforts on things that are not necessarily more important. That's not the right term, but things that, you know, we want more uniquely on. human is what I like to say. <laughs> I'm going to start using that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can you explain that concept just a little bit further for us? I, I really loved that. And I think that that's something that it can really resonate with the marketers that are that are on this uh, that are joining us for, today, for this session today. Yeah, I I think when you get started in this area, or if you like develop this curiosity about AI or you hear it and it sounds really cool, there's almost this instinct to like do AI for AI's sake. Like I want to go get some AI. I want to do something cool, something different. Um, that's not how it works. Like what you need to do is you have to find a business case for it. So it's either a use case where it's a repetitive data-driven task that you do over and over again. Like Another practical example would be scheduling social shares, figuring out what to share on Twitter and when to share it. That should not be a human powered process and it won't be um, mm -hmm. in the near future. Um, media buying would be another, like it's not something humans should be messing with, digital uh, ad spend and things like that. That's, um, humans aren't uniquely capable of doing that. Machines are better at that than humans. So you find these use cases that reduce costs by removing the inefficiency of humans doing tasks they shouldn't be doing. Um, the other way to think about AI is uh, solving business problems. So we're trying to grow revenue $1 million in this vertical next year. We tried to do that last year and it didn't work. Why didn't it work? And so this is just like any other business problem. You approach like, well, we need to achieve this goal. So then you go through analysis of like, what are the issues and drivers? Why didn't we achieve this last year? Um, or if you can apply it specifically to a content situation, we were trying to generate 500 leads with this content campaign. We got 100. Why? How do we avoid that happening next time? And so you go through and you analyze what's gone wrong. And then you come up with a matrix of ways, solutions to do it better. And within that matrix, maybe smarter tools. Like maybe we just needed a better way to predict performance or a better way to predict what would trigger a behavior or an action. And so at the end of the day though, the only reason you should be thinking about AI in your business is the same with any technology. It should reduce costs or accelerate revenue or both. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't buy marketing technology period unless it's gonna do one of those things. This is just smarter marketing technology. So the same basic principles apply. You don't need AI. You need smarter solutions to business problems like, or better ways to do your job. Like, <laughs> so it's crazy, you know, me owning an AI institute that I would say you don't need AI, but you don't. It, it, the, it just happens that it's the underlying thing that lets you do your job better and smarter. Absolutely. Yeah. When I'm, because we have a platform, right? And we're talking, I'm talking to, customers or prospects that are considering using interactive content all the time. And, and while I think that I know that there's a lot of marketers out there that say that interactive content is, you know, really cool and it makes really beautiful experiences. I'm always talking about the value that interactive content is going to bring to your marketing long term, And the fact that you can build in our platform without code, which means that you can update it quicker. You're not, you're not, um, uh, chained to a developer, you're not, you know, chained to an agency to to do all of the the hard work for you, and not and then not be able to optimize it or change the the content as um, as needed. I always like to explain the the long term savings, the cost efficiencies, the time efficient, the time savings that you're going to have by using a platform like ours. Yeah. Not how you should have just interactive content because every single marketing list for every year for the last five years have said that more interactive content is a trend. Right. Um, and I, um, I love to just talk about, you know, where interactive content would fit in the strategy and, you know, how it's going to improve, you know, marketing over a long yeah. time. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something What does that, success look like? Like the answer, the thing we always ask any potential sponsor of the Institute or any client yeah. for the agency is like, what does success look like to you? Is it, is it leads? Is it brand awareness? Like, 
Do you, mm -hmm. you know, I came from the PR world. It, it's real hard sometimes to justify the value of PR, but there's an intrinsic value within the organization. A lot of times they just want to be a part of the conversation to the CEO to see his or her name in the media tells them, okay, like we're relevant, like, and that's fine. Like that can be a goal just to, to, to get placements, to maintain awareness, to like maintain relevancy. It's mm -hmm. fine. As long as you know, that's what success looks like. So if I'm buying I interactive, yeah, like I'm buying it to generate leads for my business or I'm buying mm -hmm. it. I'm not buying it just to have a cool tool so I can tell people I built an assessment. Yeah, you don't, like, you don't want a bigger no, marketing like, stack. Like, yeah. I, I want to make sure that my marketing stack is manageable and it makes sense. Like, right. hey, I want Ion to be on every marketer's marketing stack, but I know that if it's not a tool that's going to, that you're not buying the tool because you actually have a challenge that this tool is going to solve, then in one year you're going to be churning. Right. You're, not, you're, anyway. you're, you're leaving yeah. anyway. And, and I'd, then I'd rather you never join because yep. you know you know how it goes. I mean, it's it's harder for us to uh, to acquire new customers than keep them. So I'd rather you stick around. So while we're talking about about um, adopting AI, um, do you think that this is an approachable technology for all companies, including small businesses? Um, and if that is the case, why do you feel that adoption has been a little bit slower, especially with SMEs? Uh, I answer the second part first. It's slower because it's abstract. It's mm -hmm. a, it's, um, when you hear AI, you have these preconceived ideas about sci-fi movies and just like crazy stuff that's intimidating. And, um, so I think a lot of marketers just assume it's some sci-fi abstract thing that the mm -hmm. geeks should worry about, like let it worry about AI or whatever. And it's not, it's not approachable. Like it's not a simple thing. And it really is <laughs> like it. At the end of the day, if you just understand that it helps you make predictions about outcomes and behaviors, then you already have a business case for needing to understand what's possible with it. Um, and so I think that's one of the biggest challenges is it just seems like an unapproachable topic. Um, and then you get caught up in that. Ah, it's just all hype. Like it doesn't do anything. And it's like, no, it's it's going to have a more profound impact on your life than the internet. Like it's literally going to change everything. You use it to your point, like, dozens of times today you will use AI and you won't even care. Like you mm. don't get rerouted in Google maps around an accident and think, thank God for machine learning. Like you <laughs> don't think about AI, but it makes your life better every day. Um, and that's, what's going to happen in marketing and sales there. The software will eventually be infused. Every piece of software you use in marketing within the next probably three to five years will be infused with versions of AI. Um, and it'll just become second nature and you'll appreciate it, but you won't necessarily care. My point now, whether you're a small business or an agency or work at a big enterprise, you can go find it. The tools are already out there. If you know what it's capable of doing and you can understand how to assess your use cases or business problems, you can go find smarter solutions and get a really big uh, competitive advantage over your peers and over your competitors. Just not enough people are looking for smarter solutions. They don't know to look for them. Yeah, we actually just got a question that um, I didn't realize that we've been talking for 15 minutes already. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I'm all over the place. Um, we we did get a question, though, that asked, what is the best way for a marketer to keep up with AI trends? And um, one of the questions I had that I wanted to talk to you about was AI Academy for marketers. So yeah. this might be a good answer for for this for this person. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So again, the Marketing AI Institute I created, um, and it, it is online education and event business. So in terms of like ways to come together and learn, those are the two ways we do it. So we have AI Academy for Marketers is on-demand courses. Think of it like Coursera meets, meets Netflix. So you can pay a monthly or annual fee and get on-demand access to, there's more than 30 courses. And then there's five deep dive certification courses like machine learning 101 for marketers or um, beginners to data and analytics like AI for data and analytics, um, intelligent automated agency, things like that. So those are paid, but mm -hmm. we also treat it like a media company where we're content marketers. And so we have a weekly newsletter that's free. We publish three to five articles a week. We do spotlights on vendors that use AI, AI powered marketing and sales vendors. There's over a hundred spotlights on those. We spotlight experts. So we've tried to become that like one-stop place for marketers to learn about this stuff. And then we also have a free beginner's guide that has over a hundred other resources like books, free online courses, uh, research reports, things like that that can help people. 
Awesome. Yeah, we'll go ahead and we'll post the link to that in the chat. And then also you have something coming out next month too that could also be helpful, right? The State of the Industry report? Is that no, what you're No, no, referring? the podcast. Oh, the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we have a couple of things going on. Yeah. Yes, we are launching the Marketing AI Show podcast. So that will be um, live in January of 2021. We'll go live with probably the first five episodes uh, with them. Yeah, so. awesome. So lots of things to to keep up and and listen on your run or listen when you're at or read on your desktop. So lots of cool things to keep up with on trends there. And then um, we got a question um, where someone would like to hear your favorite case of you uh, AI use in marketing. Yeah, as a content marketer, uh, you know I tend to gravitate towards ways to do content strategy and production better and. Uh, I mentioned Market Muse earlier, and I, I think it's just a, a great example because they've pulled together a number of use cases uh, that collectively enable content marketers to create smarter content. So in particular, uh, what they'll do is they'll analyze, as I was referring to earlier, your existing content. And I don't know if you, if you have a republishing strategy, but this idea of you know maybe once a year, every 18 months, taking your top stuff and republishing and resurfacing it for your audience, putting it in the newsletter, um, but not just changing the date and republishing, enriching it, um, yeah. making the answers fuller, adding new content. And that's been a, a big help for us with Market Muse is um, doing our republishing better and creating more value for users by uh, understanding what questions people have without us having to go do a bunch of keyword research and analysis. So the, the, in, the, it does it, and then it'll actually create a, a first draft brief for us. So it'll it'll write the initial draft, which probably is a little bit crazy to people, but it does. I I, so I actually, I hosted a webinar uh, like a month ago on repurposing your evergreen content into new interactive experiences. And it's something yeah. that I've done a, a, several webinars on over the year. I did one in 2016, another one in 2017, because it's just something that every marketer wants, right? If you invest all of this time to creating a really great piece of content, you should get more life out of it if you can. And interactive content gives you an opportunity to take, you know, a great ebook, turn it into an assessment or a great, you know, assessment and turn it into a, an ebook, depending on, you know, how the data goes that though here we do do this, but that is 100% human effort. And it's not, uh, it's, it's not easy. And, and it's not quick. It's something that does take us a lot of time between looking at the data, between paying attention to what our customers are engaging with to measuring the attendance of our webinars, because we do our webinars based on content that we're launching around that same topic. Yep. Um, so it's a lot of effort. So I hope my boss is listening, but I'm going <laughs> to ask him about, <laughs> yeah, I've actually never looked into market use yeah, I you know I know that it's the uh, we have a couple of customers that have used it and have um, had questions about integrating with it with ion as well so yeah. I know it's a really great tool yeah um, there's dozens of these organizations but they're yeah market is the good people um yeah they're, they've been one of our longtime partners and we've really been using the tech for the last year yeah definitely have a content marketing crush on miss Ann Hanley so <laughs> yeah <Anne's about. laughs> um I, uh, when I, I met Anne a couple of years ago at, I want to say it was probably inbound. It was right around the time that Everybody Writes was coming out and we were wearing the same glasses and, I was, and her, and I was just like, hello. <laughs> and, Anybody who's met Anne knows like there, there are definitely people in the industry where you, you hold them up to the stand and then you meet them in person. It's like, uh, kind of a letdown. Yeah. Anne is the opposite. It's like, whatever you think of her, you're going to love her 10 times more once you meet her in person. She's and just an incredible person. I know. And I walked over and I was like, hi, Anne. And she's like, I follow you on Twitter. And I'm like, oh. <gasps> You do, I know. <laughs> so it was a very, uh, very um, warm and, you know, I mean, we're marketers. We're all the same people. Yeah. We're not, it's not, she's not Angelina Jolie, but you know what? She's lovely. And and uh, it was really great to meet her and, mm -hmm. and uh, definitely lived up to, to, and her, her newsletter is so she's, she has awesome. this really great balance of, you know, professionalism, but still adding in a little bit of her personality. And uh, I just love her. So, um, so someone, so we got another question. Mm -hmm. uh, when the subject is technology, a lot of people talk about the number of jobs that we'll lose because of automation. Um, how do you think it will impact marketing? So this is a question we pose when we do these expert spotlights. We ask this rapid fire at the end. It says um, net effect over the next 10 years, more jobs lost or more jobs gained because of AI. Uh, I tend to fall on the side of 
more jobs gained. Um, it's hard to say what those will be because when disruptive technology comes along, it's hard to see around the corner and say what that's even going to mean. But I do believe that entire new career paths will be created, entire new majors in college will be created um, because of AI. And uh, I don't know exactly how that's going to look. There will be uh, there will be painful periods, though. There will be jobs lost um, if you're specialized in easily automated tasks. So, mm -hmm. for example, um, if you A/B test landing pages all day long and that's all you do is just A/B test stuff, that that won't exist. Mm -hmm. um, it could it could be done now if people knew what to look for. There's quite a few things like that that are very repetitive, data driven tasks that there's no reason humans should be doing them. Um, and, and so I think, again, if you're very, very niched in your career and you just do these data-driven things over and over and over again, that's going to go away. But that's not just marketing. That's any anyway. any industry where data-driven repetitive tasks exist, they're, they're going to be intelligently automated. Um, but there's yeah. going to be other career paths that open up. I uh, just posted... Um a link to an example, uh, an interactive content experience um, that we can post in the, Marina can post for us in the chat. It's a piece of content that was created by one of our customers out of Australia, they're a university. Um, and they created this assessment where it predicts the likelihood that your job will be uh, phased out due to AI. And it's, in terms of complex and complexity, this experience is wild. So mm -hmm. there are roughly like 400,000 potential outputs that can happen on the back end of this experience because there's, I think, 4,000 jobs. Um, and then they have your highest level of, of uh, degree and then, um, you know, where you're located in Australia. But in any event, you you fill this out and then it just gives you the the data breakdown of whether or not that that job will be obsolete. So definitely explore it. It's interesting. There's jobs in there that, you know, are not really relevant in the US, but I still think it's a pretty interesting experience to engage with. Um, so we did get another question. Mm -hmm. um, introducing AI into small independent businesses can be costly over the long term. Um, and that's the, the, the question. So can it be costly uh, over the long term since we want a lower fixed cost? So do you feel like the costs um, of adding AI to a small business are worth the benefits that they could get? It depends on the use case and the business mm -hmm. problem you're solving. So if you go with a business problem approach to, to finding AI tools, you should start with what's the, what's the value of solving this problem. So if you're spending 50,000 a year now to do whatever that thing is, and you believe that for $20,000 a year, you could do it more efficiently than do, do that all day long. Right. So it, it, you know, that comes down to that. The, what, you're gonna, what happens is there's no one AI you go by. There's no magic AI switch that just makes everything intelligent automated. You're, you're gonna do it at a, a narrow task uh, use case level. So you can find tools like a, another example I like to use is Pattern 89. So we do a decent amount of Facebook advertising. Um, what their tool does is it takes all of their customer data in, all the ads ever run through their system, and it predicts what ad you should run before you ever run it. So if I'm going to spend my 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 a month on Facebook ads anyway, rather than spending the first two weeks testing at A, B, C, and D against each other, theirs will run predictive models of those four ads and then tell me which one to use before I ever mm -hmm. spend a dollar. Right. So as a small business myself, that could save me a ton of time and money and could improve my ROI on Facebook advertising. So if you find the right use case, even as a small business, I mean, we're a small business, we use over a dozen AI tools at the agency. Yeah. None of them cost us a ton of money. They're just, they just solve a problem we had. Yeah, no. I love that. And I love that. That sounds like a really fantastic tool. Mm -hmm. um, so we only have a minute left. So I want to say um, first, yes, the recording will be sent to everyone via email. So uh, look out for that. But I want to give you, Paul, a chance to plug something. <laughs> what uh, do you yeah. I, one thing I would say is um, we do have the state of the industry report we're working on with Drift. And I, I say that because we're using Ion to do it. So it's kind of a cool example of how we're using <laughs> an assessment tool, which is just score.marketinginstitute.com. Mm -hmm. And it lets people walk through the survey questions, but then it presents you with 50 
sample use cases that you can rate on a zero to five scale of the value to intelligently automate. And at the end, it produces a report for you that shows you everything you rated a three to a five, and it actually will recommend there's more than two dozen vendors in the match system. And if we have a vendor that matches the use case you rated highly, it'll actually surface that for you within ION. Um, so where you, one, it helps you prioritize use cases and potentially find vendors. Two, it helps us capture information for the state of the industry report, which we're gonna publish in January, uh, co-branded with Drift on where we're at in understanding and adoption of AI in the industry. So kind of a dual plug for ION and, a, and <laughs> for something we're working on. No, I love that. And then also, you know, visiting the site. We, we'd mm -hmm. love everyone to visit the site and learn more about what you guys are doing. And that actually is a really good segue to talk about what our, our next uh, interview jam session will be. We have an, a jam session next week that I'll be leading that talks about building an interactive content team. But Pasanya, our CMO, is going to be interviewing the VP of content from Drift uh, mm -hmm. on December 16th. So um, that would be a really great session to join into to see, you know, we can talk about Paul in that session as well, <laughs> as well in this really cool report that seems to be coming out. So uh, thank you guys for joining us. And, you know, again, Paul, thank you. Thank you for Absolutely. coming. Absolutely. It's really, really good conversation. And uh, I hope you come and have a, a do another one with me. In, Anytime. In the awesome. All right. Thanks, everyone.